Thank you, Chrissy, and welcome everyone to Common Audit Findings in Federal Student Financial Aid. Uh, this was a request from you. Uh, it was the number one request we found in 2017 when we did not-for-profit uh, related webinars. We always ask on our evaluation form what you would like to hear about, and student financial aid was at the top, and so we do use those evaluations, so I do encourage you to complete them. So we are excited in early 2018 to be able to provide you with some common findings and a little bit of information about how you could correct those problems. So my name is Melissa Galasso, and I'm a director in our audit professional practices for Cherry Becker, and I sit in the Charlotte office, uh, but with me today, we have Matthew. Matthew, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Absolutely. Thanks, Melissa. My name is Matthew Saha. I'm an assurance partner in our higher education and not-for-profit practice sitting also in the Charlotte office. Well, we are really excited to have Matthew. He specializes in this in particular, and so we're always excited to have some of our people out in the field on a regular basis who do this every single day to share their knowledge with you. So hopefully we'll be able to impart some of Matthew's wisdom throughout today's webinar. Uh, so Matthew, what are we hoping to accomplish today? So really when I thought about this, this session, what I wanted to do was sort of look back at Cherry Beckert's audit files, and I, I dug back sort of as long as our our document retention period um, allows us to, which is about seven or eight years, and sort of identify the most common uh, compliance program findings that we've had specifically related to student financial aid programs. So I've collected all those and tried to get sort of the most common errors that I see, uh, and hopefully be able to give the audience today uh, the opportunity to, to be able to describe those themselves, what kind of common errors and omissions happen when processing aid to students, and then to recognize those deficiencies and, and really think about the next steps necessary to create a corrective action plan and, and to make sure that those errors don't happen again. Well, that is pretty ambitious given that we only have a one-hour webinar, so let's dive on in a little bit about what are you, what is your real goal today? So I think all of us who uh, practice in this area, whether we're uh, director of a financial aid uh, program at an institution or even practitioners in the audit practice. I think we've all kind of had this head against the wall feeling at some point or another because the regulations are, are quite vast in this area and it's impossible to be an expert on every idiosyncrasy within uh, the student financial aid regulations. So we all know uh, this feeling. We've probably been there one day or another. So my, my promise in, in just the one hour that we have, I really can't promise that you're, you're going to feel that much more uh, confident about things, but at least my goal is to make you feel, even if you're still frustrated, to uh, have a smile on your face and to understand you're not the only one going through this and there's plenty of practitioners and, and uh, fellow institutions out there who have had findings, you've had to get them resolved. So hopefully you can feel a little bit better about um, a situation that would come up where you would have a finding in getting it resolved. Right, misery loves company. That's basically our, our concept here. <laughs> so let's start off with our very first polling question of the e or evening, I guess it's still afternoon. Uh, it's only one, uh, East Coast time. So we're asking what type of institution are you with? So are you here as a private college or university, a public college or university, a community or technical college? Are you a higher education auditor? We have quite a few of those we saw from our uh, list of registrants on here. Or are you just here for some CPE? None of this is really in your bucket, but you really could use some extra either yellow book or perhaps just generic CPE. You don't want to wait till December in order to get it done, so we can appreciate that. Remember, there is no submit button. So long as the black dot is not next to no vote, we have captured your response. All right, Chrissy, it looks pretty good here. It looks like we are not getting a lot more uh, movement, so we can end that poll and broadcast the results. And Matthew, what are your thoughts on the fact that it's uh, almost a near tie between those who are here for CPE and those who are from a private college or university? Not too surprising. I've been there before. I know what it's like to get in your CPE, and uh, even if this is it's not completely applicable to what you do, you know, it's it's still good to, good information to know should, should anybody ever 
you know, approach you in a bar or a social setting wanting to know a little bit more about <laughs> So this is for a beer pong later in life. Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> All right, let's uh, keep moving on here. So as you said, you went back and looked at a lot of our most common audit findings. You've kind of laid them out here, and I noticed that you bolded uh, the first three. Can you tell us a little bit about why you did that and what some of those common findings were? Yeah, I think we see a lot of errors around return of Title IV funds, and a lot of times if you have one, it kind of triggers another too. So that's kind of where I wanted to start off in that area and talk about the, the common things. And then the others are sort of all over the place. Uh, no sort of theme to the rest of them, just tend to be more complex areas or little areas that uh, require a little bit more communication across departments and often lead to errors. All right, so let's look here. I think this is probably my favorite photo you've selected for the entire webinar. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you picked this. I just, I think because this is such an, an area where we see a lot of findings, I just think on, on the surface, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like when we're going into return of Title IV testing, uh, this is a little bit like the flow chart you need to think about when you're, when you're going through this process. It's, it's a little overly confusing at times. So I just throw this up there as to say, you know, we, we get it. We uh, come into this area quite frequently and see, um, see little things that are wrong, but it, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and that's why we see a lot of findings. All right, well, yeah, so it's that concept that you're just not alone. So let's start off with the return of Title IV, also here noted as R2T4, uh, and just go through some of, one, the basics, and then what is the auditor really trying to look at? Uh, absolutely. So you know, the basics uh, from, from a perspective of the institution is anytime you have a student who's receiving uh, federal financial aid, and they withdraw from the institution um, early. It could be for, for any uh, reason whatsoever. Uh, the institution has to do a few things. They, they really need to calculate the amount uh, of the semester that's been completed so far, uh, compare that to the amount of aid that's been earned out of the, the specific aid that's awarded to that student based on their very specific circumstances, and then return any aid uh, that was not earned and return it within a, a, a pretty tight time frame as well. So uh, there, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong uh, in this process. And really from the auditor's objective side, you know, we're coming in here trying to make sure that you uh, returned funds anytime you had a student uh, withdrawing and you return them in the proper amount in a, in a timely manner. So that's really our objective. All right, so let's look at a couple of issues that you've identified here. So issue one is that the institution is not aware that the student has withdrawn. And, and I know this sounds like it's crazy, but we know that that's not an, uh, that is a statement that we hear very frequently. So why does that happen, and what can we do to fix that? Yeah, and maybe, maybe the institution not knowing that the student has withdrawn isn't the most accurate statement, but uh, maybe someone at the institution <laughs> is aware that the student is withdrawn, but the, the correct people at the institution, the people uh, in financial aid that need to process and calculate the return aren't aware of this. The people in the finance office who actually you know, initiate the return of the funds uh, and physically transfer any, any monies that need to be returned back are not aware. So a lot of times what we see here is that there is an overall lack of communication between uh, the various offices that need to be talking to each other to make someone aware on a timely basis that a student has withdrawn from the university. Now, uh, to give you a, a little hint as to how we tend to catch this, we do not go to your list of uh, your return calculations and say, hey, you know, out of the people that you've done calculations for, we're going to sample out of this list. As a practitioner and auditor, we select usually from a list provided by the registrar's office of who is withdrawn uh, from the institution. And it's not untypical for us to get multiple lists of withdrawn students from different people or different departments and have um, 
some names that appear on one list and not another, or dates that uh, disagree with one another. So you can see how this uh, can kind of cause uh, some miscommunication errors in there. So obviously, if the financial aid department is not aware that the student is withdrawn, they have not even had the chance uh, to calculate uh, the potential return of funds, and right away you're in noncompliance. And we've got some references to the to the Code of Federal Regulations throughout here too, just so you know sort of specifically what areas we're um, talking about. All right, excellent. So I think that's a, a great one, and I think uh, we'll go into here uh, and talk about some possible corrective actions that an entity can undertake in order to deal with that that issue that you're not aware. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, often see, you know, lack of communication being the key thing. So looking at your com controls around your systems to track withdrawals and to communicate those to the people that need to know about them is very uh, important. A lot of times we see very ad hoc or manual uh, processes around this, not a lot of formalized uh, controls that lead to that good communication across departments. Uh, so developing a more formalized process uh, uh, of what happens when a student does withdrawal is very important, uh, including uno unofficial withdrawals. So, um, you know, you will have times where um, for, um, you know, certain reasons students just kind of stop showing up at class and uh, stop attending. Maybe they've had uh, family emergency and they've, they've left and they're not thinking about filling out uh, paperwork and letting you know that they've withdrawn or there's, they're going for other health issues or something. So even though uh, they've left and they haven't maybe notified you, uh, they're not showing up to classes and, and after a certain amount of time, they have unofficially withdrawn from the institution and you are still held to the same standards as far as uh, timelines on being, having to calculate your, your uh, refund and, and to process that. So you need to consider processes around even those unofficial uh, withdrawals. Um, additional training, uh, you know, is important in this area, making sure that, you know, your student financial aid staff uh, know the process, know how to do the calculations, uh, not completely relying on, on one, one person to get this done if they're on vacation or something else, then all of a sudden the clock is ticking. So having a champion that can help other people understand this and cross-train people is very important. And then performing self-review too. I mean, I encourage people to, um, if this is an area that they don't think they have robust controls, to, to kind of test themselves, pick your own sample. The, um, depending on the size of your institution, you may not have a ton of withdrawals um, from semester to semester. So you maybe want to just pick some of your own and check your own work. All right, and I think that's a great form of self-monitoring, which is a control in and of itself. So if you're having a difficult time coming up with a control activity, monitoring is always a great opportunity to develop that. All right, so the first one is we don't know that they have withdrawn. Second one is we did know they withdrew, but we might not have gotten the math correct. So what are some of the causes and issues here? Yeah, so you get past step one and you got the communication issue figured out. Now you actually have to do the calculations and do them right, and we see uh, even more errors in, in this uh, all the time. So. A lot of people are re relying on software to do these calculations, and um, most of the software works uh, fairly well, but again, it kind of depends to make sure that some of the, the dates you have and the setup are correct. Uh, there's a, always a chance for human errors. I go back to my example on that institution I had that had uh, sort of multiple lists of students withdrawn that had different uh, conflicting dates with one another. So what is the official date of withdrawal. If you obviously get that date uh, wrong and use the wrong information for that, you've calculated the, your calculation wrong right from the get-go. Uh, and then just an overall lack of understanding of how the, the calculations work as well. So we discover this, obviously, we're, we're coming in behind you and we're recalculating everything uh, ourselves uh, to, to 
confirm that um, our calculations agree with the institutions based on the information that we've received um, independently from financial aid. And you know, the most common issues that create these calculation errors um, that we see are sort of you know, incorrect dates used for the withdrawal date. So you've got the wrong, you've put in the wrong date to begin with because um, you know, it was communicated incorrectly. Incorrect dates for the start or end of the semester, sometimes that can get confusing based on calendars. Um, there's a lot of different start and end dates. You know, there's when students move in, which isn't necessarily when classes start. So if you've got someone setting up the software and they've put in the incorrect dates for the beginning or an ending of classes, then that's going to create calculation errors right there. Uh, and then another common issue that we see too is sort of these, these breaks that fall over um, a weekend. Thanksgiving is one of those typical breaks where um, you get Thursday and Friday off, uh, and the Monday after you may have classes, and some institutions will start on that Monday. Uh, some institutions will also provide that Monday off. If you have a, a break of five consecutive days um, that crosses over a weekend, if Monday and Friday are off, you include those days in the break period. Um, so that can create a difference of you know, whether you're starting class on Monday or not uh, being a two-day break versus a five-day break. So again, if you get that wrong, You've, got, you've, you've essentially calculated everyone wrong for the semester. So a lot of these mistakes impact the entire population of students that you're processing. So that's why we see this more commonly uh, as an error. And if you're seeing it, you know, it's going to be something that's reportable if it's done consistently. So it's not going to be, if it was a one-off, it might not be reportable. But if it's consistently done, it's going to hit the threshold for reporting purposes. And so obviously here, you've given the effect being that noncompliance. And again, you've provided the CFR uh, information for those who have an interest. All right, so now what can a school do in order to have a corrective action plan to prevent or detect this? So uh, possible corrective action plans, you know, if, if a software is being used, uh, which most institutions are using uh, a software to help calculate these uh, returns, you need to formalize a process to make sure that the start and end dates of the semesters and those, all those break days are properly configured in the software to make sure that the software can do uh, its job. Um, if, you're, if you're not sure whether the software is working right or has been configured correctly, one way you can do a double check is to just perform a a side-by-side -side manual calculation. The Department of Education has a, an R2T4 worksheet that you could kind of do manually by your side alongside your accounting software and make sure you're getting to the same amount uh, between uh, one another. And then really, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see some repetition around this uh, throughout the presentation, but, you know, always making sure people have the proper tools, uh, continuing education, uh, as regulations change, uh, just having a robust uh, education to your staff is, is going to be uh, key as well. And uh, if uh, loss fails, uh, consult the Student Financial Aid Handbook. That's usually, as auditors, a place that we go when we're uh, not sure or we're stuck on an issue trying to figure out if something was done right or not. Uh, just as much as, as folks out there who are actually practicing use it, uh, your auditors use it as a reference uh, point as well. And I think we've actually, in the back of the presentation, created some, some links uh, that you can, you can go get some of these resources as well. All right. Always arm yourself with as much information as you can. All right. So now we have identified that the students was drawn. We've calculated it correctly. But now the issue is that we didn't do it in a timely fashion. So what are some of the reasons here? Yeah, so the, the rules are no later than 45 days after the date uh, you determine the student withdrew. Obviously, if you're, you can see how some of these earlier errors could lead to you missing this compliance issue as well. So if there's bad communication, you're not aware that the student withdrew, and you learn very late after, uh, obviously you're, 
your window gets really short here. So sometimes when you have one finding uh, in one of those earlier situations, it leads to another finding down here in that you're returning things uh, late. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to, to return the funds. You can either do it through deposits um, or transfers into your, your school's federal funds bank account and then award and disperse it to another student. A lot of times those types of transactions are happening really early on in the semester and you're just sort of um, crediting money back to your federal cash account and uh, awarding it back out. Those are considered effective uh, refunds. Uh, you can use the G5 system, which has a refund function right into it. And then you can even old-fashioned issue a check uh, to the Department of Education. I don't see a lot of people uh, uh, processing manual checks uh, these days anymore. It's probably a good thing. They take a long time to get done. Yeah. All right, so let's do a little bit of analysis here on the why and the impact. Yeah, so, you know, obviously if, as I mentioned, if you've got inadequate processes to identify withdrawals, it's going to lead to late uh, refunds being made. Uh, so lack of coordination uh, d between departments. Uh, there's sort of a series of people that need to get notified as sort of the register learns first and financial aid does the calculations and then usually it's someone in, in the finance office that controls the actual funds and transfers between bank accounts or the G5 system. So there's a lot of people that in a row need to line up to make sure that this happens. Uh, obviously on any samples that we make, we're verif verifying the timing of the funds uh, returned by the institution. Um, obviously the effect is noncompliance and um, as far as corrective uh, actions, typically this comes down to a, a, a communication issue. What we don't like to see here is people putting a corrective action that's very generic, like a one-sentence statement that says we're going to improve policies and procedures around return of funds. Uh, we'd like to see people have sort of a, more of a, a robust description of exactly what they're going to do to formalize processes a little bit more to make sure that uh, they're not late in the future. And I think that always goes back to knowing who's responsible for what and the communication between it. And so when you're doing your corrective action plan, if you can actually identify the who and the what and the when, it actually improves the overall information uh, and actually helps you develop the plan. Absolutely. All right, that brings us to our second polling question. And again, there is no submit button. Uh, we're going to just ask a question about your findings. And so have you had a student financial aid finding in the past? And so your choices are yes, within the past year, uh, B, yes, within the past five years, uh, yes, but it's been more than five years, no, I've never had one, or E, I'm not with an institution of higher education, and therefore I don't have to have a student financial aid compliance test performed. So again, um, there is no submit button, so long as that black dot is not next to no vote, you are in good shape. So again, just no black dot next to no vote, as long as the black dot showing up next to A through E, we have received your vote. All right, looks like there's still a tiny bit of movement. All right, Chrissy, we can end that poll, and we're going to broadcast the results. So. What do you think? Uh, are you surprised at all by any of these findings here? No, I see quite a bit of brave folks that are saying yes, and that's not uh, that's not a surprise. I think the student financial aid cluster of programs is very difficult to maintain over a period of five, ten years with, uh, without having a finding creep up uh, here and now. Um, to those who said no, um, good for you. Either you're very robust or you've got lazy auditors, one or the other. <laughs> And uh, obviously, for those without higher ed, ed experience, uh, no surprise there. But yeah, this is just an area where um, you do see a lot of findings. And again, you know, the, the biggest thing, and we didn't ask this here, maybe we should ask this next time we do this, is, is those having repeat findings. That's kind of the biggest issue. You see, it's OK to have some findings every once in a while, but if they're repeating year after year, that's going to put you on the radar of Department of Ed and, and get you a, a program review. Yes, yeah, we'd like to try to help our clients not have that.
All right, so let's take a look here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about verification now. So we're going to move on from those return of Title IV, and we're going to talk a little bit now about verification. So I, I like your little overlap here. How does this work? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I've heard verifications, uh, the, this whole process kind of described as this middle area between having to sift through a stranger's uh, financial information and kind of giving you the feeling like like you're an IRS agent and, and uh, maybe questioning, did, is this really the job I signed up for, having to sift through people's tax returns and FAFSA details to, to make sure that they're not, uh, they're not lying about any of the, the information that's going into their uh, expected family contribution and, and calculations for age. So it's kind of that middle ground uh, in there. All right. Well, I mean, we don't always get to do things that we love to do in this world. So once in a while, you got to do something uh, that you might not be thrilled with. But here are some of our common uh, verification issues. So can you walk us through some of these areas? And again, we have the citation down there for those of you who want to take a look. Yeah, so we see um, a lot of different issues uh, when uh, we look at, we come in behind you and look at your verification. Uh, process. Uh, typically, any anytime we're picking a sample as auditors, whether it's uh, 25, 40, 60 students based on risk, um, basically anyone who's gone through the verification process, we're going to come in behind you uh, and look at all of the documentation behind uh, the verification procedures and what you did uh, to resolve and verify any uh, conflicting information. So we see findings as simple as, you know, verification worksheets not, not being signed um, to uh, more uh, complex issues uh, typically surrounding conflicting data between the students' um, ICER, which is derived uh, in most part by information on their application for federal aid. Uh, and other documents that they've submitted, either tax returns or other self-affidavits, so untaxed income differences, household size differences, filing statuses, et cetera. Uh, sometimes there's conflicting information. And there's not good resolution and documentation around how uh, the institution resolved those conflicting informations. Um, and then sometimes you have required corrections. You need to recalculate EFC based on uh, information that comes out of the verification process, and those corrections uh, don't end up get processed quite correctly, and they lead to uh, incorrect EFC, which leads to incorrect uh, aid amounts. All right. Well, you mentioned that conflicting data is one of the common issues here. What are you actually supposed to do when the information is conflicting? Yeah, so, you know, there's only so much you can do. I, I, I mentioned feeling like an IRS agent. You know, a lot of people feel um, like they're out there trying to, to, pr to protect the federal government uh, from people uh, trying to uh, uh, falsify some of their financial data to get as much student financial aid as, as, as possible. And, of course, there's um, always the chance, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be students out there who apply for aid and um, uh, have learned the system and know the system of, of amounts and household sizes and, and taxable income uh, to be able to get the most aid uh, that they can get. And you're really not required to, to detect uh, intentional uh, fraudulent activity. Uh, of, from students trying to, to, to juke the system. So a reasonable assessment of the data is what's expected um, from the institution as you strive to catch errors in the data. It's really about trying to see where do we have, maybe they didn't understand the FAFSA when they were completing it and they uh, have a maybe a non-traditional family and they know, oh, well, you know, grandma and grandpa live with us as well, and do they count as part of the household or do they not? And you have different information from tax returns versus what they've filled out in their FAFSA. It's really about reasonably assessing the data so that we can catch those errors and correct them and get the right uh, dollar amounts. Uh, <laughs> however, you know, if you believe that there's something fraudulent going on, you are required under 
the federal regulations to refer that information to the OIG. So kind of like in an audit, we're not expected to catch fraud, but if we do, uh, we're obligated to communicate it. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about verification and what should we be doing and what should we not be doing. Absolutely. So a bunch of the do's on verification, you know, tired of me hearing this, but, you know, making sure people understand uh, and your, educa uh, your verification uh, procedures for your institution, uh, especially uh, those larger institutions we know that have loan officers that um, turn over uh, and you got new people coming in and out all the time, making sure people understand uh, how they're supposed to document verifications. Um, continuously monitor and revise your, your verification policy and, and process. Get that as, as formalized uh, as possible and make sure that people uh, understand it. I've got some institutions that go as far as making people sign sort of an annual um, training form that says that they've been through uh, the training and, and understand the institution's policies and procedures around verifications. Uh, and some people just do not have a very robust uh, uh, policy in place and need to take a look at that. Uh, I would say err on the side of over-documenting resolutions of conflicting information. Sometimes we'll get down to, to um, looking at this information and uh, it's not actually written in the file, but it's, it's some loan officer's memory of, oh yeah, this was the situation for that particular student and it all makes sense, but it isn't documented and written down um, in the files that we're looking at. So making sure it gets well documented. Uh, and, you know, monitoring the process, uh, having, a, having a way to monitor your process to make sure it's, it's actually working effectively and, and doing some self-checking. Self as far as the do nots, um, you know, of course, don't don't keep telling yourself you'll get better educated next year. Uh, that that's not a way to, to to solve any issues. Don't be relying on your staff's memory of the issue. Uh, again, that comes down to documentation. Uh, hopefully, you're not doing this and re relying on your external auditors uh, as your source of internal controls. We are we are not an internal control of the institution. Uh, we may find something and help you. Um, identify situations where improvements may, need to be made, but you shouldn't be relying on your external auditors to kind of uh, audit your own, own processes. Um, and then don't assume that the process is flawless because you've never had a finding. Uh, sometimes, you know, sampling isn't perfect, so uh, sometimes errors exist and there's some sampling risk and we're not going to find uh, that error. So just because you haven't had any issues in this, I think it's a good area for institutions to be aware of there's a lot of findings here and this is an opportunity for uh, a lot of manual errors. All right, excellent. So we're going to switch gears here now and we're going to start talking about Pell Grants and over and under payment. And so why do we see this as a common deficiency? So, you know, this really has to do with sort of, again, lack of formal controls. Um, a lot of times sort of towards the beginning of semesters, there's a lot of um, adding, uh, deleting, dropping classes, and people's uh, enrollment status may change kind of early on in each semester. So uh, you can fluctuate between full, three quarters, half, less than half time, and all of those things are obviously going to have an impact on your Pell Award uh, for the semester. Uh, another thing we see is incorrect EFCs. EFCs are drive the Pell Grant formulas, and so if you're using a, an old EFC or, or have had some revisions that come out of the verification process, you're going to get to the incorrect Pell Grant uh, award. Uh, and then I've even seen sort of incorrect Pell formulas being used. There's different, different formulas and different tables depending on what type of programs uh, you're enrolled in, so credit hour versus term-based versus clock uh, hour and non-term hour programs. There's different, uh, there's different formulas and sometimes you can use the, form, the, the wrong tables. So there's lots of different areas here uh, to make mistakes, which is the reason you see a good bit of findings in this area. Well, anytime that there's multiple formulas and you have to be particular, I think that there's just 
it's bound to happen. So if we have these known risks, what are some plans that we can do to mitigate that? Absolutely. And you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but, you know, check once, check twice, check again. You've got to make sure that you have uh, a more formal process in place, uh, especially to handle those enrollment changes uh, that happen kind of very early on and during in between uh, terms that might change uh, the Pell Grant award amount. Uh, again, making sure that any changes in EFC that occur while awarding aid are, uh, are taken into consideration in ultimately determining the Pell Grant uh, eligibility and award amount. Uh, having a Pell, you know, I think Pell Grants that have so much going on that it's important to have sort of a champion within the financial aid department that understands uh, maybe the Pell Grant program uh, the best out of all of the folks involved in financial aid and can be sort of a champion and, and trainer of other folks coming through. Um, sorry, I clicked ahead there one moment. But... Um, <laughs> There's no stealing my uh, thunder. That's all right. <laughs> Having a champion is... is um, you know, an important part of making sure that um, all your folks stay educated and, and understand the, the ins and outs and inner workings of how Pell Grants get awarded and calculated. All right, excellent. Uh, let's just move on here. There was a discussion this morning between Matthew and I over where this uh, this term came from or this quote. And if you know in the chat box, let us know where is the origin of this, because neither one of us could remember. But we definitely know that it came from somewhere. Uh, but the question here is what happens when the aid exceeds the financial need? We gave too much to people. What? Uh, oh, I have a lot of multiple attendees are typing. Jerry McGuire. Hmm, I'm not so sure. Let's uh, see what everybody thinks in living color. I was thinking the same thing. That's too funny. So what happens, Matthew, when the aid exceeds the need? So, so when you, you're giving out too much money um, and essentially awarding too much in total aid, combination between institutional and federal aid, uh, you've exceeded uh, the financial need and you've, you've had a compliance finding right there. So more money, more problems, and I think it is – Notorious BIG, now that I'm seeing that repeating, uh, yes, it's a single by them. That's where it is. I remember this. <laughs> See, um, the fun things you learn on CPE. I bet a lot of people did not think we were going to have to think about any kind of songs from a rap song, especially uh, many years ago. So things that you're going to have to cover. I'm glad that somebody knew. <laughs> Neither one of us did. All right, so what are some of the causes of giving out excess need, uh, excess aid above someone's need? Yeah, so some of the areas that I saw based on looking at our, uh, our files were um, incorrect budgets being used for the, the students' total cost of attendance. So the total cost of attendance for students is going to vary from student to student depending if they're, uh, you know, enrolled full time, if they're on campus versus off campus, what um, undergraduate, graduate, what, what programs they're in drives their cost of attendance. And sometimes the cost of attendance that is um, set up in, in, in the system is incorrect based on what the, the student is actually enrolled in. And that's something that we're checking as part of the audit process to make sure and, and we recalculate the cost of attendance based on the information we receive on exactly what uh, the student is enrolled in. Um, Sometimes non-Title IV funds uh, are not included with financial aid received, so they may be getting some institutional uh, grants or state uh, money that uh, is not getting uh, properly factored in. And there's some, uh, it gets to be a little bit complex as far as how some of those uh, institutional or state awards affect your ability to receive different uh, federal awards. There's different impacts based on different uh, types of aids, so that's another area of complexity where we see uh, causes some errors. Uh, poor systems of, of checks and balances over identifying uh, and, and awarding aid, and then just again lack of sort of things come down to a lack of communication and training. Often, you know, we get down to the details on this, and it just goes, oh well, this was 
this was in that group of uh, students that it was Susan was new and she it was just her first batch and um, yeah she made a few mistakes here and there, there was just kind of a lack of understanding on behalf of, of a staff member. And I think communication issues are just really common, especially the more diverse the university, the more layout and the, the bigger and more complicated the, the setup, it can just be hard to make sure communication is happening. All right, so what can entities do to ensure that they don't get this funding? Absolutely. So, of course, you know, training is important. Uh, continued formalization of your procedures uh, around this. And again, having those, those um, champions to, to really help train the rest of the department is also very important. Um, ensure that your process of awarding aid captures all types of aid uh, being awarded. It's not uncommon these days for um, one single student, um, depending on financial need, to be getting uh, awards from seven, eight, nine different uh, sources just to get their financial aid package uh, to a level that they need uh, to, in order to enroll you know, in the institution. Uh, the, there's a lot of diversity in uh, the students that are uh, entering college right now, which creates a lot more complexity for financial award uh, packages. Uh, review your systems and calculations and don't always trust your, your software to be perfect. Uh, make sure that, uh, again, this can sometimes come down to how things are set up in the software program. If they're not uh, identified correctly within the software, they're not going to uh, calculate correctly within uh, deducting from the financial need and, and awarding programs. All right. I think sometimes I think the last one is that software concept. And I think we have started to just believe computers. Like as my, I have a 10-year-old uh, daughter, and if it's came out of Google, it has to be right. And it's always baffling to me. I'm like, well, don't you think you need to check your source? And she's like, no, the computer told me so. And so obviously, Computers can make mistakes, garbage in, garbage out, and this all is just set up. So I think it's important to just step back every once in a while and say, does that make sense? All right, that leads us to our third polling question of the day. And so let's take a look here. Again, there will not be a submit button so long as that black dot is not next to no vote. You are in good shape. And so I think <laughs> this is a... This is going to be an interesting one. So what was your favorite Super Bowl commercial? And I will let Matthew walk you through the various options here. Yeah, so I think people are pretty familiar with, with some of these. Amazon Alexa has a cold. Obviously had some celebrities in there uh, taking Alexa's place as uh, the, the, the respondent to Alexa inquiries. Uh, the Tide Laundry commercials were just classic, uh, just just has me thinking now every time I'm watching a, a show and I see a commercial come on, if I'm not quite sure what they're advertising for, I'm, I'm like, oh, it's, it's a Tide, it's a Tide commercial. It's got to be a Tide commercial. Uh, Doritos Blaze and the Mountain Dew I saw that had the, the great scene between um, Morgan Freeman and uh, I don't know the actor's name, Tyrion Lannister, uh, doing the rap uh, kind of lip sync. Of course, the, the Bud Light Night uh, uh, was a good one. I can't remember what went down. And then, uh, of course, some people are just not going to watch the Super Bowl. It looks like about 30% so far. Didn't even <laughs> so. oh. oh, there's some requests in here. So some people think that the uh, not or the NFL's, I almost said not for profit, the NFL's dirty dancing scene, I have to say, I didn't see it the day of, but I did see several um, news stories afterwards. I just thought it was hysterical to watch. So. Uh, that one does go down. Uh, some of them, that they were all bad. I can definitely appreciate some of that. So, all right. Thank you, Chrissy, for ending that. Let's broadcast and see what everyone thought. And uh, you got a pretty good uh, list here. Uh, there's a little bit of spread out among everybody. So, um, <laughs> so apparently Don is with us here. The, uh, the NFL's Dirty Damn thing uh, is definitely up there. I think it's a female-male thing because these are the ones that Matthew came up with, and I think I would have come up with a very different list. So I think that's a male fail a uh, male female thing going here in terms of our favorites so very very interesting all right because the dirty dancing one didn't even cross my mind to put up there and <laughs> oh come on that was priceless priceless 
Oh, see, all the girls are sliding with me now. All right, let's move on to some of the other topics before we close up today's webinar with uh, entrance and exit counseling. So what are some of the common findings here? Yeah, so um, exit, exit, and, uh, exit and entrance counseling is one of those things where um, uh, you have to do it in, in certain time frames. So uh, sort of it's another one of those, uh, the, the, the thing that uh, gets the finding is not that it wasn't done, it's typically that it wasn't done in the time period that it was supposed to have been done with. Uh, so sometimes we see entrance uh, counseling not conducted or not documented for those uh, first time, first year uh, borrowers. Um, sometimes exiting material is, is not, uh, an effort is not made to mail that material out if a student fails to do the, the in-person or online counseling. Uh, some of this, we'll see correlations between sort of that, um, that lack of communication when students withdraw and um, some of these exit counseling findings. So a lot of times when people are exiting the institution at a non-traditional time, not at um, graduation, when people typically exit, uh, but they're doing it, they're, they're, for whatever reason, transferring out or dropping out early, uh, you still have some requirements to, to do their exit counseling or making sure that they get the material if they don't do it themselves. Um, so the withdrawal students will see uh, Oftentimes, that um, that is uh, an area where if they've left and you can no longer get in touch with them, uh, we don't see the exit materials being mailed within uh, the appropriate amount of time. All right. Uh, I think there's a question specifically here from Celeste on if a student leaves or withdraws from school before you receive their exit, what else can you do to stay in compliance specific to this area? Well, I think from the institution standpoint, as long as you've shown an effort and you've, uh, if they haven't done it themselves, because a lot of institutions now have, you know, either a live session that you have to kind of go in, show up, and do your 30-minute exit counseling, or a lot of institutions have put in a, a web-based exit counseling program where they sort of go through an audio-visual type program. Uh, obviously, you can't force a student to do it, but uh, if they haven't, you've got to make a direct effort to get them the materials. Uh, so I think you just need to uh, be uh, showing them that you've mailed those uh, materials to the student. Um, and that's really, I think, all you can do to, to maintain compliance uh, with yeah, that. It all really comes down to documentation, right? So just have evidence that you, you did your best. You can't force, you can't hold someone hostage, but you just have tried your best. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this love triangle we have going here. Yeah, so again, this is the, the uh, I remember just a particular institution where I had this, uh, this issue and it was a lot of, when we had a, some uh, findings around exit counseling that wasn't uh, completed, we had a lot of finger pointing that was being done between departments. So registrar was saying, well, we, we did our part and we sent an email to so-and-so over in financial aid and um, uh, finance was aware of this and, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of back and forth that happens and going, okay, well, who's, who's to blame here uh, when you have a finding and sometimes it's not who's to blame but what, you know, what do we need to do in the future to create uh, an atmosphere and a process where this, this doesn't become uh, an issue. So it really comes down again. I feel a little repetitive here, but down to communication uh, again and making sure that uh, there's a process in place, uh, especially around those withdrawn students, uh, to making sure that they're, they're getting this exit counseling done uh, in time to meet the regulations. Absolutely, and I think it's all about learning to play in the sandbox together and know that you're all on the same team, right? So I know finger pointing is an easy way out, but, you know, we've been trying to work on teaching our kids that if we all play on the same team, we end up with a little bit better results. And so let's not point fingers, let's try to find the path forward together. All right, credit balances. Now this sounds really, really exciting. So tell us why do we find errors here in the credit balance section? Yeah, so 
this is, you know, this is comes down to bookkeeping and the fact that, you know, um, there's typically a lot of activity that's posting, you know, to the student's account uh, at the beginning of each semester. Um, and depending on sort of the timing of, of uh, enrolling for classes and making certain changes, uh, you can have a lot of situations where uh, a credit balance is created in a student's account, meaning uh, they've made payments and, and, and had aid posted that exceeds you know, the charges that they uh, had to pay for their account. So they're sitting there with sort of a, a credit balance, almost like an unclaimed check uh, that needs to be taken care of. And it's a pretty, this is one of the areas with, with the tightest time frame that the institution needs to act uh, in order to release that credit balance uh, to, to students. So it's just a 14-day uh, time frame and two weeks goes by really quick. So uh, oftentimes when we're looking at the details for the sample of students that we've selected and we're going through and looking at uh, all the activity that's posted to that student's accounts, we'll see a period where there existed a credit balance to that student and it was in excess of 14 days before uh, the institution released those funds um, to the student. Um, and if you're doing that and holding those credits without the student's authorization, you're in, you're in violation right there and, and that's a finding. All right, yep, students are entitled to their money and if you want to hold it, you need their permission. So, all right, so what are some things that they could do in order to have a process to be able to identify this? So, um, you know, obviously you need a trigger. You need some sort of um, reporting, probably on, on a daily basis, uh, to be aware of when student credit balances are, are being created uh, in, in accounts. So once they're, once they're created, you need a formalized process to be aware of it and to track those number of days remaining to make sure that funds are, are released on a timely basis. Uh, if you don't have something in place to do this, uh, like I said, two weeks goes by really quick and uh, just a, a, a little lack of um, timing can create uh, multiple instances of, of findings in this area. I agree. And I think if you just have a standard report that auto runs on its own and sends it to your email, it kind of can help. Uh, the more you can automate this without having to require someone to manually do it, the easier it gets. So you have talked about a lot of different uh, you know, resources that are available to different people and different entities. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about why you selected these? Yeah, so the, these are the resources that uh, me as an auditor that I, I reference a lot of times when I'm not really sure um, what the right solution is. And the, the nice thing about these is they're, they're cross-reference against the Code of Federal Regulations quite often. So you uh, uh, can can feel confident about the the source of the information and getting to the, the answer of your question. So the student financial aid handbook is something all practitioners are probably well aware of, but um, is probably one of the the top resources um, for any student financial aid compliance matters. Uh, of course, the uh, program review guide for institutions is um, is another uh, key resource as well, and I provided a, a link that you can get to that. And then even if uh, uh, you're more curious about this subject and want to hear about other uh, typical program review findings, now this comes from the Department of Education uh, and these come from specific program reviews that they do. So this would be Department of Education coming on site and doing their own uh, separate audit. And program review audits tend to be uh, even a bit more intense than uh, single audit compliance reviews. Uh, They've got their list of top 10 audit findings uh, that I think you'll find interesting and you will probably find a good bit of overlap between our experience and the Department of Education's experience. Uh, and then you'll at least find two that are different because uh, they got top 10 and I think we only went through eight here uh, in the last hour. Yeah. We need a much longer webinar for those if we wanted to go through everything. While we're going and doing our final polling question, there are a couple of questions that are in the um, in the chat pod. So I'll let um, 
my, uh, Matthew take his time to look over it while I read it and then see if he has any. If we can't answer all the questions that come in, we do promise to send you an email uh, with a response. So we will respond to all questions that come in. Uh, it might take us an email to do it, but I'll give Matthew a couple of seconds while I read this to you. Has your institution ever had a repeat finding for student financial aid? So your choices are yes, no, you don't know, or you're still not with an institution of higher education, but after this webinar, we have convinced you to go and work for a university, right? That's our goal, really, right? So uh, while they're answering that polling question, are there any ones that you want to take over the uh, phone here before we uh, end, or do you want to um, do you want to take them mostly via email? It's up to you, Matthew. Let's see, I see some that I think I can knock out here. Just this last one, if a student fails a course, goes through the entire semester, does the administrator have to complete an R2T4 to determine if they've earned 100% of their aid? I do not believe that there is any requirement to do that. If they failed, they failed. But if they've completed their semester um, and have not exited early, there's no need to complete an R2T4. Um, Talk about the stale date checks before and after the 240 days. That one, you might have to email me that question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, if a student attends the spring semester, is pre-registered for the fall, but does not attend, what is the appropriate separation date? I think it's going to be the last date of classes for the spring semester. Um, but I can verify that uh, if you want to send me an email. Do, do, do. I'm trying to go back here. While Matthew is looking through those, there is Matthew's email. So uh, we'll close up this poll right now. So if you want to end that poll and broadcast the results. Uh, so we have about 18%, almost 20% who have had a repeat finding. Um, most uh, either have not or aren't sure or continue to not work for an institution of higher education. Uh, so let's bring us back to this close.